Hello and welcome to today's event at Center for Policy Research. This is a book discussion with one of India's most di distinguished diplomats and foremost, foremost experts on China. Mr. Vijay Gokhale's new book, After Tiananmen, The Rise of China, covers the period between the end of the Cold War and the global economic crisis. Uh, before we begin, a word from our president and chief executive, Yamini Ayer. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a real privilege for CPR to be able to host uh, Ambassador Vijay Gokhale uh, at this very, very important discussion on his fantastic new book, After Tiananmen, The Rise of China. So thank you very much for taking the time to be with us uh, to discuss your, uh, your book. Uh, CPR has had the privilege of engaging with you uh, in the past in your avatar uh, when, when you were foreign secretary and uh, we are absolutely delighted and privileged to have the opportunity to continue this engagement in your new avatar uh, as a diplomat, as an intellectual and as an author. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, uh, everybody in the audience knows you well, but for the sake of form, uh, I will take the uh, opportunity to formally introduce you. Uh, ambassador Gokhale has spent nearly four decades in the Indian Foreign Service. He was India's ambassador to China and in the country's foreign secretary until January 2020. He dealt with China from various diplomatic positions in Delhi, China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong for nearly three decades. He is the author of Tiananmen Square, The Baking of a Protest, and The Long Game, How the Chinese Negotiate with India. Ambassador Gokhale, welcome to CPR. And uh, this time we have you virtually, uh, because as we were just discussing before we went live, uh, there are very few reasons for anyone to visit Delhi uh, in the months of November, October, November, and December. But I hope that uh, in time for your next book, uh, the one thing we do know about you in your post, uh, 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 in your retirement life, is that you're absolutely not retired and are probably one of the most prolific uh, authors, putting all of us uh, whose day jobs it is to, to write <laughs> shame. Uh, so I know there'll be another book very, very soon, and I hope that we can have an in-person discussion with you uh, in a better climate uh, in Delhi uh, in the future. Thank you so much for making the time for us and really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yamini. Uh, before we begin, just some housekeeping. Uh, the audience is requested to type their questions or comments in the Zoom chat box. I'll try and pick as many of them as I can during the time for audience questions. Uh, Mr. Gokhale, uh, let me begin by asking you the very obvious question. Why this book? Did it flow out as a natural consequence of your previous book on the Tiananmen protest? You know, I know you say this is not a sequel to that book, but an accompanying volume. So what were the drivers and motiva motivations for spending hours on your desk to produce this crisp and very meticulous book? Uh, thank you, Sushantji, first of all, both to you and Yamaniji for inviting me to this event uh, and for talking about my book. I really appreciate that. Uh, you well know that uh, China has been, of course, a professional subject for me, but it has also been my passion. And through the uh, four decades that I have uh, served in, uh, in the government, I have increasingly felt the need uh, for our citizens, for citizens from India, to know more about China, and more importantly, to develop our own perspective about uh, the developments inside China. There are a number of excellent books on India-China relations, but very few writings by Indians on developments inside China. And so I had decided closer to my date of retirement that I would spend some time uh, writing about China uh, based on, of course, personal experience, but also some amount of reading uh, of literature and uh, uh, understanding of facts uh, to interpret what was happening in China for the Indian audience. And Tiananmen Square, the making of a protest was the beginning uh, for two reasons. First, because uh, China's modern China began to emerge after the Cultural Revolution in 1978. And I wanted to write about this very interesting period between 1978 and 1989. Uh, and secondly, because I was present in China during the Tiananmen crisis. And that's why I wrote that book. Uh, the second book covers the period 1990 to 2010. Uh, it is a logical sequel, although it is not strictly speaking a sequel, but this period also is very interesting to understand China. 
So uh, these are the reasons really why I wrote these books on China. Uh, Mr. Gokhale, you have spoken earlier about this, this, and you have spoken to me as well. And I'll paraphrase you that we in India seem to be seeing China only through the Western prism. There's hardly any original work on China happening, whether it is in academic, media, policy, or even security spheres, which seems to be the dominant theme uh, with respect to China and India. Uh, despite the fact that it is our largest neighbor, you know, world's second largest economy, challenging the only su superpower in the world and the biggest strategic challenge faced, faced by us. Why, in your view, is it important for Indians uh, to understand China independently without any intermediation through the Western gaze or the Western prism? Yeah. Uh, in the past three years, uh, Sushanji, uh, I've passed a lot of literature on China. And invariably, uh, the, the best literature or well-researched literature comes out of the United States and the West. Uh, now, uh, I think that however objective a researcher or an academic is, she or he looks at any subject uh, from a certain national perspective. And the perspective of the United States and the West obviously differs from ours uh, for two reasons. First, we are a proximate neighbor. There is zero degree of separation between India and China, uh, while with the West, there is a geographical separation. And therefore, the perception is different. Second, the United States and the West are developed countries. For most of the uh, previous 40 years, China has been a developing country. And therefore, the dynamic between them is rather different from the dynamic between India and China. If we look at China simply from a Western perspective, I believe that we will make uh, incorrect or inaccurate judgments. Uh, and I don't just mean in the national security or political field. I mean in almost every field from business to culture. Uh, because China is increasingly a big player in international affairs in any field. And we need to have a proper understanding. Uh, to give you an example, Sushanji, there is a big debate in the United States at the moment, and I happened to be there a couple of weeks ago, on whether China is a rising power or a peaking power. A number of scholars now believe that China has peaked, that it might never overtake the United States in economic or military terms. But as an Indian, uh, surely our greater concern should be that irrespective of whether China is a rising power or a peaking power, that it is an economy six times ours and has a military capability, for uh, a, a military budget at least, which is four times our size. And therefore, irrespective of the future trend, we are still dealing with a formidable power. Uh, and therefore, uh, an Indian perspective lends a sort of corrective to a Western perspective and grounds us in making policy which is uh, Indo-centric rather than Western-centric. And that's why I feel uh, we need to up the game uh, in research in India uh, on China. Now, there are a number of excellent young scholars, Indian scholars, uh, in a number of institutions spread through the country who research China and who know the language. But I still feel the ecosystem is not available. And by that, I mean, there has to be both intellectual and financial support to such people and such institutions. And the involvement, therefore, of business and industry, of media and of national security structures and governance structures are all important. I hope that as we go ahead, this gains traction. Mr. Gokhale, you spoke of the uh, of the policy importance of understanding China from an Indian view for policy making. What about average Indians? Somebody, let's say, who's a student, somebody who's in business, somebody who's living his daily life. Why should he or she be interested in looking at China from an Indian perspective and not carry or imbibe the Western gaze or Western biases that may uh, that may come to him? What? Why is it important for such a person? Yeah, uh, you know, I think, first of all, there is a lack of knowledge, even basic knowledge about China in India. Uh, I teach courses uh, in uh, a number of institutions, and I am 
surprised at the relative lack of knowledge that uh, young people display about seminal events in China like the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and the Tiananmen incident. Now, you cannot understand what is happening in China today without understanding those events. Uh, and I was explaining to my uh, uh, group of students here in Pune last week that to really understand Xi Jinping, for instance, you have to understand that he was born in the 50s as the son of a high-ranking leader, and that must have had some influence on him. He was the son of a disgraced leader in the 1960s, and he suffered greatly as a result of that association by being exiled to a village and living there for almost 10 years. That too must have had an impact on his psyche. And then you have a series of appointments between 1980 uh, in the rural areas uh, where we did not hear much about him, but where he must have garnered experience. And I was telling them that if we do not have a perspective on this, how do we judge this individual who is going to be a dominant player in international affairs for many years? Uh, so the short point is uh, we must develop a stronger uh, China watching capability and uh, we must be able to write it in a less academic and more interesting manner for the average Indian uh, consumer or the average Indian reader to consume. And I think when that happens, uh, 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 we will be in a better position. But as of now, I am really uh, loath to say that uh, our, uh, the average knowledge that Indians have of China is substantially less than that they have of the West. That brings the, the question about uh, Xi Jinping brings me to my next next point. You know, after the 20th Party Congress, the commentary, particularly Western commentary, global commentary, seems to draw a straight line from Chairman Mao to Xi Jinping. Your book, which came well before the Party Congress, and I'm sure was written much earlier than that, uh, makes a very strong and persuasive argument against that characterization by focusing on leaders like Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, and, and Zhu Rongzi. Uh, Zhu seems to be, particularly seems to be your personal favorite too, going by the book. Well, you know, why are these leaders and the period they governed China so important for us today? Why should we in India read about them and, and be interested in that period? Uh, that's a really excellent question, Sushanji, and it goes to the heart of this book I wrote. Uh, of course, there are certain straight lines between Mao Zedong and Xi Jinping, a consistent thread that runs through the 70 years of the Communist Party is the belief that they are the best uh, option, political option for China, and that they must ensure their continuance and their survival at any cost. Uh, so to that degree, uh, whether it was Mao, whether it was Deng, or any of his successors, they have not deviated from that. There has been no thinking of democratization or of separation of powers and so on. But I think the big difference in this period between 1990 and 2010 was that they approached the handling of uh, governance very differently from the Maoist period and somewhat differently from the current period. Uh, to my mind, they did two things which were fundamental in leading to the rise of China. First, the party itself took political risk to do reforms. Uh, now, this is interesting because this is a party which ought to have been on the defensive after the Tiananmen incident. But in fact, in many areas such as the economy and even in culture, education, and intellectual discourse, it went on the offensive. And this is an interesting phenomenon that we need to know about and we need to study. Uh, the second thing was, despite the authoritarianism that is there in China, and has always been the case, there was a relative relaxation of authoritarian controls during this period. Uh, in other words, the party sort of stepped back from governance, from uh, business, from intellectual discourse provided, of course, that you did not challenge its authority. And as a result, there was an explosion of ideas, of culture, of art, of science and technology, of innovation, of entrepreneurship. 
which allowed for this spectacular growth. And therefore, the, 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 the critical uh, point I make in this book is that this combination of taking political risk and of relatively of relaxing authoritarian controls, relatively speaking, was what has led to the rise of China. And in my final chapter, I try to suggest that to some extent, the unwillingness to take political risk and the reimposition of controls that the current leader has done will also subsequently impact on China's development or all round development. Now, whether that pans out or not is something we must see, but uh, I do believe that it will have some sort of an adverse impact. Uh, Mr. Oakley, I can't help but ask you, why is Zhu Rongi such, such a big favorite of yours when it comes to that period? No, I don't think he's a great favorite of mine. But, uh, you know, even before the Tiananmen incident uh, as mayor and subsequently party secretary of Shanghai, he was advocating uh, a moving away from the traditional economic policy of, uh, uh, of so-called Marxism, Leninism and Mao Zedong thought and uh, was uh, sort of encouraging a mixed economy and experimentation. And he had the courage to do that when he became the premier. Now, we should uh, remember that uh, when a leader in a democracy takes political risk, and that often happens, and that political risk doesn't pay dividends, you lose in the next general election, or you are likely to lose in the next general election. But in a communist system, you not only lose power, but as we have seen in China, you very often lose personal freedom. And we saw that with Chao Zayang, you also might lose your life. And we saw this during the Cultural Revolution uh, when a string of top-ranking leaders, President Liu Shaoqi, Defense Minister Pang Dawai, Foreign Minister Chen Yi, all died in prison. Uh, so I think uh, the risk he took uh, is not the normal risk that leaders take in a democracy. It was an extraordinary risk that he took. And he stuck to his guns and he broadly delivered uh, those economic outcomes that he had hoped uh, and Deng Xiaoping had hoped when they went for the reform and opening up policy. For that reason, I think he is a relatively unsung hero of the rise of China. Mr. Gokhale, although you do not mention it explicitly in a book, uh, except for a couple of places, the one constant underlying theme as I saw in the book is the uh, what I what you write at one place is skillful political handling of the challenges by the by the Chinese political leadership during the three decade period. You know, contrary to the popular caricature that we see in India, that an authoritarian ruler can turn a very large ship like China by his personal diktats, you you seem to show that by various incidents, decisions, and anecdotes uh, that you cover in the book, that it required managing the various factions of the party, which were very powerful the army, which was a very, very powerful instrument because it had uh, brought the revolution, the larger public, which in some ways had to be pacified and brought on board, foreign governments because they were influencing policy and their support was needed by China at that point in time, and foreign leaders who may have been antithetical when they were, campaign when they were campaigning in the elections, like President Bill Clinton, uh, and the international environment after the Cold War, which was so anti-communist and, and, and negative, about, negative about, the, about the Communist Party. You know, it seems that at some point the Chinese could have miserably failed. They were walking a very, very tight rope, but still managed to, to pull through. So what led the Chinese leadership to take such big risks? And what provided them the skills, actually, to navigate through this period so successfully? Because it's a very, very tight rope that they seem to be walking, which you yeah. clearly bring out in your book. Well, I think what led them was the Tiananmen incident of 1989 itself. Uh, I think they realized that uh, the economic, the underlying economic causes, high inflation, uh, 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 joblessness, um, uh, uh, lack of uh, growth and output, uh, that all of this was impacting on people's lives. And that it was no longer possible to claim political legitimacy on the basis that Mao Zedong and the party had liberated China from feudalism and civil war and distress. Uh, there had to be a new 
reason or a set of reasons for the Communist Party to exist. And therefore, uh, uh, Deng realized that despite uh, the problems that had happened in the economy, he should stick to his reform and opening up policy with some tweaking in order to address key economic bottlenecks. Now, there were really two big economic bottlenecks. The first was, of course, the entire welfare system. The system that the, the party is your mother and father and will look after you from the cradle to the grave, which was an enormously expensive prospect when China began to join the international markets. The second, of course, was public ownership. Like Prime Minister Nehru, uh, the Chinese leaders had also believed that the public sector should uh, control the commanding heights of the economy at a time when they had no other industry. But of course, by the 1990s, China had developed a certain amount of industrial capability and uh, without competition, the public sector was becoming uh, very top heavy and non-productive. Uh, the challenge was, of course, that uh, tackling both these issues was essentially a political problem, not an economic one, because the likelihood was of having an adverse impact on social stability in both cases. And if there was one lesson that the Chinese leaders took away from Tiananmen, it is social stability was above everything else. Without social stability, the party could not continue to rule in China. So uh, it was an extremely difficult job for Deng and his successors to, on the one hand, do fundamental reforms of these two pillars of public ownership and state welfare. And on the other hand, to ensure that there was no negative fallout in terms of social economic stability. Now, uh, the book really describes how this was done, but it was made even more difficult by the fact, and we don't recall this very often, uh, it was made even more difficult by the fact that they were in uncharted waters. Uh, they, they had no experience of running a mixed economy and they had untested human resources. They had no individuals who had experimented with economic reform in quite this manner. Uh, and therefore, it was literally by following Deng Xiaoping's maxim of feeling the stones on the riverbed and crossing the river one foot at a time or one, one step at a time. Uh, now, things could have gone wrong and there were points at which uh, uh, they realized that the policy was not uh, going forward as they had intended. But uh, the leadership uh, was a technocratic qualified leadership as well, highly educated, and many of them were, had a technical background. And they took those corrective measures that were needed uh, to, uh, uh, to correct the drift, the economic drift in particular. And I think that is what really um, uh, uh, political management was about. Uh, because had they not managed the politics of reform, it could just easily have gone the same way as the 1989 Tiananmen incident. And the fact that there has been no major uh, public display of disaffection after 1989, I think speaks volumes for their political management. Uh, you spoke about Dung, and Dung is, of course, uh, later on seen in great light. But your book describes when that Dung begins the famous Southern Tour. It is not even covered in the Chinese media. It takes a couple of years before it is allowed to be covered in the Chinese media. Of, of course, later on, it is recalled as their signature step, which President uh, Xi Jinping, after the previous party congress, tried to uh, try to uh, copy as well in some in some in some manner. Would you like to comment on that? How how tough it was for somebody like even Deng Xiaoping to push through with his uh, narrative and agenda? Uh, you know, Sushanji, I think one of the misconceptions that exists very widely in India is that the Communist Party of China is a monolith where a single leader uh, says that everyone must jump this way and everyone jumps in that manner. Uh, if you were to see the history of the Communist Party from 1921, uh, and there is an excellent recent book written by Tony Sage uh, called From Rebel to Ruler, uh, which talks of the entire history of this party. You will see that uh, the history of the party is one in which uh, factionalism, is a dominant trend, not 
or not, uh, uh, that it is not a case where one leader was so completely dominant through much of this time. Uh, Mao Zedong himself had to struggle a lot for many years before he became the supreme leader around the 1940s. And once the People's Republic of China was established, he continued to face challenges uh, from many of his uh, uh, co-leaders. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, as we know, had to actually sacrifice two of his self-appointed general secretaries because they fell afoul. Uh, and uh, uh, even in the era of Chiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, there were regular purges when people fell afoul. So the point I'm making is that there was, there was and we must presume there is opposition and dissent within, the, within this massive party, which has a certain internal dynamic that may not be visible. And uh, what we saw in 1992 was the spilling out of that internal dynamic into the public gaze when Deng Xiaoping, uh, who was extremely concerned that the conservatives were reversing his reform and opening up policy, uh, took to literally took to the streets, uh, went on this public tour and uh, preached from the pulpit and finally turned the population around in a manner which made it difficult for the leadership to go against him. Uh, so we, uh, it is one lesson that we must uh, keep in the back of our minds is that however monolithic this party looks, uh, there are different points of view that exist. And uh, we never know when those points of view may come forward. And therefore, constant research and updating on the internal situation in China from an Indian perspective by Indian researchers is very critical in my view. Uh, in the first chapter, uh, Mr. Gokhale, there's a, there's a throwaway line where you say uh, that Dang, uh, Dang warned in 1990 itself that the West would spare no efforts to topple the communist regime. You even go on to add, and I quote you, uh, the seeds for the rivalry between China and the United States that would sprout after Xi Jinping assumed the presidency in 2013 were in reality already sown in the aftermath of the Tiananmen crisis, uh, uh, unquote. Could you expound on that statement, please? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, now Deng's speeches are public, uh, but they weren't this case uh, uh, for many years after 1989. Uh, but what we do know now is that Deng Xiaoping directly laid the blame or a substantial part of the blame for the blowing up of the Tiananmen demonstrations into a full-blown crisis on the door, at the door of the West and the United States in particular. We now know that he spoke about efforts by the West to utilize this movement to bring the Communist Party down. Uh, we also know uh, that he told President Nixon, former President Nixon, who visited China shortly after the Tiananmen incident, that the United States was waging a war against China without gun smoke. In other words, a sort of peaceful war, uh, which would bring China down. And he also made this comment to a number of others, uh, and these comments are now public. So I think there was a very clear correlation in the minds of the Chinese leadership of the activities of the West and the internal political turmoil that occurred in China. I'm not saying this is, this is something which might be right or wrong. I'm simply saying this is a perception in the Chinese leadership. And that perception has persisted for the last 30 years. However, Deng also realized, and so did Chiang Zemin, by the way, that there was a contradiction because they also needed the West uh, in terms of capital, in terms of technology, and in terms of talent, if they were to uh, revive and then uh, grow their economy. Uh, and therefore, you have this situation where uh, Chiang Zemin and Hu Jintao decide that the main problem is not rivalry with the US, but economic development. And they decide to, uh, to sort of uh, not confront the United States. So the hostility and the sense of uh, at the adversarial uh, sense that they have go subterranean during their regimes. Of course, by the time President Xi Jinping comes to power, a number of developments have taken place. China's GDP has grown manifold. China's military power has grown manifold. China's diplomatic influence is much bigger. 
and the global financial crisis somehow gives the impression that China is on a rising path and the West is on a declining path. Again, this is a perception in the Chinese leadership. It may or may not be factually correct. Uh, and therefore, I think that subterranean feeling of uh, uh, adversity vis-a-vis -vis the United States now begins to surface. And so we see in uh, President Xi Jinping's uh, speeches and statements uh, an increasing tendency to refer to forces, uh, external forces, that uh, are trying to subvert or derail or contain or suppress China. Uh, now, of course, uh, it is out in the open. I think the Chinese uh, pretty much uh, suggest that the United States is an existential threat to the party. But we should not forget that right from the time of Mao Zedong, this has been uh, a thread uh, running through the party system. And after 1989, uh, this has increasingly been uh, a, one of the principal, uh, shall I say, pillars of Chinese foreign and domestic policy. In the early part of your book, uh, the end of the Cold War and the demise of the Soviet Union and the upheaval in the Eastern Europe, you know, during that period looms very large over the over the narrative. Uh, how did the Chinese leadership, uh, Deng, uh, Deng onwards, uh, look at these uh, look at these events, and why were they so concerned about about these these events? And has that view changed uh, after thirty years? Under uh, under Xi Jinping now, or the or has the view of the of the events remained the same? There is no change in their view of what happened uh, in 1989, uh, the so-called Tiananmen incident, and their concern at the time was that uh, they were already aware of the uh, developments taking place inside European communism. You already had Poland, which was. Uh, which was facing a lot of political pressure because of the solidarity movement under Lech Wałęsa. And there were also the rumblings of change in Hungary and the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia at that time, as it was known. Uh, and when the Tiananmen incident started, uh, I presume that the leadership may have linked all of these together uh, and seen this as a somewhat of a Western assault on, on, on uh, global communism. Now, uh, the fact is that the developments in Eastern Europe and the situation uh, in China really did not have any direct influence on each other. But after they had successfully regained political control uh, on the 4th of June, 1989, obviously they continued to look with concern at the unfolding of events in Europe because within a few months, the Berlin Wall fell in the same year and uh, the Eastern European regimes also collapsed in the same year. And some of them, like President Ceausescu of, Germ of uh, Romania, actually met their death, uh, deaths at the hands of the, the people. And then in the subsequent two years, of course, the Soviet Union itself collapsed. So uh, I can, if I were a, a Chinese leader, I would understandably be concerned. It is important, however, to see that there was not uh, there was no indication of panic on the part of the leadership. Uh, I think Deng uh, was a very uh, appropriate leader at this time. And he gave essentially two or three bits of advice. First, he said, we need to study why Soviet communism and European communism collapsed. And so a number of study groups were set up across the entire intellectual spectrum of China to produce reports and a great deal of research went into this. The second important advice he gave his successors was, now that the Soviet Union has collapsed, there is no need for us to rush and pick up the, the global flag of communism and start uh, waving it around because that will make us a target. So leave that be and let us focus on Chinese, on socialism with Chinese characteristics, which is socialism within our country, rather than trying to establish communism in various other parts of the world. Uh, as a result of this, I think in, in terms of foreign projection, it did not appear as if China was going to be the sort of expansionist, the ideologically expansionist power that the Soviet Union was. And I think that was important. And I think the third bit of advice that he uh, gave was that let us uh, address the economic problems of the people 
because as he correctly judged the collapse of soviet and european communism did not happen simply because they were ideologically weak or deviant but because they had not been able to deliver the goods to the people uh, of course in hindsight dung has been proved a uh, right on all these counts and uh, and therefore i think they have come out of that crisis uh, uh, relatively unscathed but till today uh, this crisis and its lessons dominates uh, communist thinking and communist uh, uh, inner party reflections and therefore i have always believed that this is a seminal event in recent chinese politics if you do not understand what happened in 1989 or if you simply adopt a western perspective or a chinese perspective of what happened then i fear uh, a lot of the analysis we make on china today Uh, may not be correct, uh, and actually, this was a driving uh, force for me to write this book on the Tiananmen incident. And I really hope that this inspires a number of other researchers in India to do much deeper work as to what the lessons learned were. Uh, you know, Mr. Ogle, is it correct that the events in the Soviet Union, the, co the collapse of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe? uh did reinforce the chinese belief that the pla had to remain under political control and not become a professional army like the soviet army became during the second world war because it was not performing that well oh yes there's no doubt about that uh now we know that uh, when xi jinping assumed uh, uh power uh he gave a secret speech in january 2013 and one of the very key points in the speech was that the communist party of the soviet union had collapsed because it had allowed the soviet red army to distance itself to become a national army rather than the party's army so that when push came to shove they did not come to the party's defense they did not stand up for the party and if you look at what president xi jinping has done to the pla uh, quite apart from the modernization of equipment and doctrine which is one part is to basically tighten political control over the party the purges within the pla the removal of commanders who had set up their own almost semi autonomous positions of power the uh, reinforcement of the point that political loyalty is more important than professional qualification and the repeated assertions that the people's liberation army is the party's army and must do it has political objectives besides purely military ones uh, this has been a repeated theme in almost every speech that the president of china now gives and the underlying reason is that analysis which emerged as a result of the tiananmen incident and the study of why soviet communism collapsed and european communism collapsed Mr. Gokhale, there are many fascinating tales in your book. One of the most significant ones is about the uh, Chinese into into Chinese entry into the into the WTO, WTO, WTO uh, the World Trade Organization. Uh, how China worked to get into the WTO, and this included much deftness in the management of local actors as well as many global actors. You focus particularly on the United States and how China almost manipulated the U.S. government and the U.S. business houses. to do what the party wanted done can you recount and explain the significance of that decision uh, because we seem to be still be, uh, bearing the, uh, uh, the uh, reaping the rewards of those of that decision so to speak yeah uh, well you know there are two versions of why uh, china wanted to get into the wto uh, one version is that uh, they understood that unless they get into the marketplace uh the reform and economic opening and the opening of policy will really not take off the economy will not take off because so much of trade had become globalized after the barriers of the cold war had fallen uh, but there is another explanation uh, which i hint at in the book which is that uh, churong ji who was the person primarily overseeing the economic change after dang uh, was passed from the scene believed that uh, by himself uh he may not be able to effect those changes and that it is external pressure which might lead to making some of the fundamental changes in the structure of the chinese economy those structural changes that were necessary to liberate the entrepreneurial forces i suspect that it is a combination of these two reasons 
both the 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 the, the uh, utilization of external pressure to bring about internal change and the understanding of the importance of the global markets uh, for china's economy which led to this but uh, the uh, uh, the main point i make in the book is the remarkable capacity of the chinese to convince the west that it was in their interest for china to enter the wto and that it was in their to their benefit if they were to make immediate concessions in return for some a uh, notional concessions at a future date that was not announced ever by the chinese uh, this capability uh, speaks not only to their uh, 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 great diplomatic deftness it also speaks to their understanding of western psychology and how they used the, their own uh, potential market potential size of population potential labor a uh, uh, potential sort of uh, 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 infrastructure because much of it was yet to be done at that time to uh, convince the west that if they invested in china they'd make huge profits now of course to be fair the west did make big profits but they also opened the doors to the access to technology equipment uh, and capital for china and uh, the chinese very quickly learned those lessons very quickly used these opportunities and eventually as we now know they have become competitors to the west in almost everything uh, at one place in the book uh, you know you compare the the how the chinese leadership at various levels at that time treated foreign investors and businessmen in the uh, this is about the 1990s how uh, with the way the indian leadership at that time uh, whether in the states or the center was dealing with the similar foreign investors and foreign businessmen uh, why to your mind and you have been in the government for so long was there so much difference in the approach and attitude of the political leadership of the two countries well it essentially sprung from dung's advice which was assiduously followed by all his successors uh, uh, at least his two immediate successors chang zamin and ruchi pao that china need not take leadership it should lie low and it should try and benefit as much from relations with other countries without in any way challenging them and obviously the subtext was that if uh, you are criticized if uh, there is an attempt to uh, demean you to humiliate you you simply take the rap on the knuckles uh, and you hide your uh, uh, light under a bushel while you get on with the job of uh, catching up with the competition and this is therefore what china did as i say in my book uh, when for instance there was a criticism of uh, certain aspects uh, socio economic aspects let us say human rights or uh, the rule of law uh, which the west was uh, 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 was very fond of lecturing the developing countries about uh, the chinese would take the rap on the knuckles without too much of a pushback Uh, whereas uh, the tendency with us was to uh, engage in repartee to immediately respond and uh, this uh, uh, while uh, you know it is uh, uh, appropriate to do so uh, and might seem reasonable from the domestic uh, perspective it does have implications for the way in which the world perceives us as well so the short point is that china kept below the radar throughout this time of course there were occasions when it Uh, showed its hand uh, as during a couple of incidents with the united states or when the you uh, when they fired missiles across the taiwan straits in 1995 96 but they made sure that they had a strong public case so that it looked like a counter response with the provocation coming from somebody else but if you leave these incidents aside if you put them aside uh, in this 20 year period there are very few instances where china was seen to be irascible or uh, irritable or angry uh, on matters where uh, criticism came from the west uh, but which if uh, uh, didn't really have any great impact uh, for them in substantive terms they would simply let that go uh, now the other point i do make is that in, in this period the chinese leadership uh, engaged with foreign businesses in a facilitative mode 
they facilitated businesses they handheld them that last mile connectivity was established in our case despite uh, the sweeping reforms in the policy that came about after the reforms of 1991 and to some degree some relaxation of uh, procedures and rules we were still very much a rule and regulation bound system and uh, uh, the at the lower levels uh, there was a tendency to talk about rules and regulations rather than facilitation uh, so for instance uh if uh, the chinese went out of their way to ensure that a foreign company was uh, registered in a day or two we would still insist that the foreign company follow a certain procedure which took maybe 14 days or 30 days uh and um uh, uh, and where uh, there are many competitors for the same limited capital uh capital tends to flow in, into areas where there is ease of doing business and i think there's no debate Uh, uh international or even within india that in the 90s and early 2000s uh, uh china was by far uh, the easier place to invest money uh, the diplomacy and the outward approach that you that you just described that actually best captured in your book by recounting uh dung's 24 characters strategy observe calmly secure our position cope with affairs calmly hide our capacities and buy our time be good at maintaining a low profile and never claim leadership you know this continued almost till the global financial crisis uh, yeah. to be followed by the chinese communist party you know uh, one is of course you explained how did the how these guiding principles helped china in the post cold war era arrive and reached at the at the destination that it has reached but what are the consequences or the risks of doing away with it in the last decade against uh, under president xi jinping you know i think we need to be fair uh, we should not uh, uh, necessarily believe uh, and i think more research work needs to be done on this that the changes were brought about after xi jinping took office uh, my own sense uh, and i give some kind of indications in this regard uh, were in my paper uh, which i did the road from dalwan where i suggested that uh, the debate Uh, in the chinese strategic and intellectual community about the direction of their foreign policy had already started from roughly 2007 2008 and the reason really was that the china of 2008 did not really resemble the china of 1992 its gdp had grown uh, uh, to a level where it was just shy of japan's gdp uh, its military strength had grown substantially its diplomatic influence was huge Uh, and the global financial crisis also exacerbated uh, the changes in global affairs so that china felt that it was much better off than others and in this in this situation when china had moved outwards uh, they were now in africa in latin america not just in terms of markets but in terms of dependence on resources and dependence on energy whether dung's 24 character uh, advice really suited them Uh, for instance there was a debate on whether or not china should have a bigger military capability in order to protect the supply lanes of communication of resources and energy which might otherwise if it is interdicted by the west strangle china's economic growth and this was what hu jintao termed as the malacca dilemma uh, similarly there were uh, 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 views as to whether or not china should diversify its financial dependence rather than putting everything in us treasuries and securities whether or not it should encourage the european unification project the euro currency uh, or other currencies uh, so a number of these discussions were taking place but i think they really crystallized uh, after the global financial crisis Uh, and uh, xi jinping when he came as the leader uh, perhaps uh, uh, had thought this through because after all he was the vice president and the leader in waiting from 2007 onwards so he must have been part of these debates and i think obviously when he became general secretary and president he weighed in because i suspect he felt and he perhaps still feels that the trend of a rising china and a relatively declining united states uh is a long term trend uh, which has not changed despite uh, all that has happened in the past 5 4 or 5 years
Uh, in fact, sir, to uh, to add to your point, a Chinese scholar, uh, Colonel Pocha, on a on a panel with me, very clearly said that you know we believe that the United States is not a relatively declining power; it's an absolutely declining power. Mm. Which, which was quite a statement. Which was quite a statement to uh, to make. Uh, you spoke about the Malacca di dilemma, and some of the people may be surprised to know that there's a whole chapter in your book about the about the Malacca dilemma. Uh, China now boasts of the biggest navy, largest navy in the world, in, at least in terms of numbers, if not the capacity of vessels or their or their or their firepower. Uh, it constructs you know ships and vessels at a rate which boggles the mind. Not only ours, but even the even the best. You explain the prime prime reason or the prime driver at some point is the expansion of the of, for the expansion of the P, uh, PLA Navy as the Malacca dilemma and the need to secure the energy lines and the and the trade routes. From there on, it has moved to assertion of its claims till the second island chain and then the regional hegemony that it that it seems to uh, now aspire for. And now we seem to be it seems to be about projecting influence. You know, and I'm being careful not by calling it projecting power. Uh, much beyond its shores, much beyond its, much beyond the region. Our U.S. naval officials most recently see everything through the prism of Taiwan, and everything is being done for Taiwan. How do you see this period for China, the thirty-year period that you spoke of, as a military power? Because it it really became a very major military power. And uh, and I must also add that you do mention the the first Gulf War and the shock and all that, and that the Chinese and the PLA uh, leadership. Picked from the first Gulf War, what they what what this what they saw. Uh, how did the Chinese traverse that journey over the over those thirty years, and why could India not traverse the same journey during that period? Yeah, I think I should begin by saying that uh, the Chinese always wanted to have a navy, and uh, declassified documents now show that uh, Mao Zedong tried very hard to get uh, both naval and submarine technology from the Soviet Union. And it was really his differences with uh, Khrushchev, which ultimately stymied that process. Subsequently, of course, as we know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the real threat was continental from what they considered to be a belligerent Soviet Union. And therefore, their focus was on land forces and to a limited extent on uh, strategic weapons and on the Air Force and less on the Navy. Uh, the real focus on the Navy started only in the early 1990s. And it started both because uh, the economic reforms obviously also required a certain amount of military capability to guarantee them. But also because China uh, again shifted its focus to the maritime domain, as India has done uh, uh, from the year 2000 onwards too. Uh, because ultimately the prosperity of both civilizations have come from the seas uh, rather than from the land. Uh, so I think to that extent, uh, uh, the, the progression that China made was uh, somewhat stunted in the 60s, 70s and 80s, and it returned to what was the normal uh, uh, trajectory it would take in the 90s. Now, essentially, uh, uh, again, as in the case of the economic reform, the Chinese sort of sublimated their uh, real intentions uh, because they did not want to alarm the West that in addition to economic modernization, they were also doing military modernization. And therefore they had to, res uh, to resort to a lot of subterfuge. And I describe in some detail how they did it with the aircraft carrier, uh, uh, which, they, which ultimately did become their first aircraft carrier. Uh, but I think the, the, uh, if you look at uh, 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 what they did in the 90s, uh, the most important point I make in the book is not just the military expansion, they also built a historical basis for claims and they created the legal structure for it. Uh, in other words, they were preparing to uh, extend their uh, uh, influence in the, in the maritime sphere uh, from the historical aspect, the legal aspect, the diplomatic aspect and the military aspect. And all of these were built up almost like a strategy, a grand strategy so that once they had the Navy, they could execute it with relative ease. And that is what is remarkable about, remarkable about uh, Chinese naval expansion. Now, as I also mentioned in the book, the one uh, sort of gray rhino that turned up was this uh, formation of the Quad in 2008. Uh, this greatly disturbed the Chinese. 
because of course what they realized was that the focus had to be on the maritime domain uh, and they, they were quite happy that the gulf war and the 9-11 and the iraq war had diverted the attention of the united states towards the middle east and central asia now all of a sudden uh, they feared that the uh, the attention would come back onto the uh, onto the indo-pacific and it wouldn't have taken too much time for the americans to realize that the chinese were massively armed, rearming in the naval in the naval sphere uh, and that is why you see this almost hysterical reaction that the chinese uh, make uh, of the quad uh, because they feel that their plans are going to be prematurely exposed the main point i make uh, and i genuinely believe this is that they have used that quad is not the reason for their naval expansion it is a pretext for their naval expansion their naval expansion would have taken place irrespective of whether quad one or quad two had come but it gives them a very convenient handle to confuse people and i think that uh, uh, that many people are willing to buy this uh, theory but as indians we should not buy it and i have explained in the book uh, in that same chapter the malacca dilemma why we should not buy this chinese theory and how we need to counter it and call them out uh, of this matter you know the chapter 6 of your book is very expansive in nature covers a vast number of issues starting for corruption and the bo affair uh, where he got arrested legitimacy of the party the questions that the party constantly faces about its legitimacy the rise of nationalism within china as a strategy by the uh, by the party the technological control that the party has exercised over the masses the the constant process of adaptation which is which has been displayed by the by the party to respond to various changes and the constant endeavor to mask it mask it realities to the uh, to the world you know they've been covered in great detail uh, de detail in that chapter how was the party able to do it despite all the challenges thrown in it you know it it would be naive to believe that the world could not see through anything at that point in time uh, the west particularly the united states had engaged china since the since the early 1970s had closely worked with it in some sense had an idea and understanding of how the chinese system operated and how they were looking at it why was china so successful in then doing this what it uh, what it attempted to do do and what it did yeah you know there were two reasons there was a domestic factor and an international factor a uh, domestically what the party cleverly did was it co-opted the new elites uh, and potential problem makers into the party so essentially a peasant soldier worker party where intellectuals academics business people and so on were considered undesirables became a party which actually welcomed business persons students and academics all of these were potential trouble makers in a, a reformed uh, a, a china so they co-opted elites uh, at the same time they also distanced themselves the party from direct uh, involvement in the governance or in the day to day governance of the country as well as in uh, the supervision of the non public sector uh, so those relaxation of controls and the co-opting of elites ensured that no occasion was given uh, for any kind of social instability to occur and of course this went down well with the west particularly the business community Uh, but internationally also the chinese played this very cleverly so for instance although we know that there are party cells in each and every foreign business uh, the chinese would downplay this aspect similarly the chinese suggested that the public sector was now autonomous and could make its own investment decisions whereas in fact we know that the public sector always remained under the control of the chinese party the communist party because its top leadership was appointed by the chinese communist party in fact all appointments to their public sector units are by the organization department of the chinese communist party not even by the chinese state or the chinese government so in a sense they uh, they uh, now another good way of doing that was to appear to be culturally less uh, shall i say oppressive Uh, so organized religion saw a sort of revival whether it was christianity whether it was buddhism whether it was islam they of course cracked down on uh, what they saw as threatening sects like the falun gong uh, 
Uh, they crack down on political parties like the, uh, the China Party for Democracy, but they allowed a certain amount of political talk uh, to, to, uh, to, to grow. So what they did was essentially give just enough for the West to justify its economic engagement with China and no excuse domestically for the West to say that the population was unhappy and that therefore uh, regime change is required. Uh, now, this is extremely skillful politics. It may seem simple, but uh, as I said, China is not a monolith. The party is not a monolith. Uh, it requires a lot of political management. And uh, I think it, the, the leadership showed a great deal of sagacity uh, in, in, the, in, in doing so. Uh, there were some mishaps. For example, uh, I do mention that uh, when Hu Jintao spoke of the peaceful rise of China, it immediately alarmed a number of countries because they focused on the word rise rather than the word peaceful. But the Chinese very quickly backtracked and uh, came up with this wonderful phrase, harmonious, uh, a harmonious world, uh, which suggested much more of, you know, uh, of a benign and gentle China rather than a rising threat. Uh, your final chapter in the book, uh, Mr. Gokhale, is about the Sino-India ties during that period in which you were, a, you were an active participant. Uh, you explained the, the, the Tibet problem and the Dalai Lama question and the Dalai Lama issue that seems to bedevil the relationship. Also the border issue, which seems to be at the, at the core of the, of, the, of the relationship now. Uh, the China's changing stance over a period of time and India's position. And you actually say that the Chinese foreign policy shift after the end of the Cold War actually led to, the, led to its new approach towards India uh, under, under Deng. Uh, 2005, you say in your book, uh, is the high point of that period. Why was that so? And why did it all go down from there? Uh, you know, uh, since uh, this is uh, uh, a matter of India-China relations, there are a lot of people in India who have done work on this subject. So uh, to be fair, you know, this is just my view and it is one view among many. But my view is that uh, the consensus or the modus vivendi on the relationship that evolved after the end of the Cold War was based on mutual necessity. Uh, for the Chinese, it was equally important in a unipolar world to ensure that peripheral states, whether it was Russia, whether it was India, whether it was Vietnam or Japan, should not become adversarial or inimical towards the Chinese. And as a result, uh, on a number of issues, they, there were tactical adjustments made by the Chinese or some progress uh, which was enough to keep the relationship going. Now, of course, by 2005, the world had changed again. For one thing, uh, the Chinese had become much stronger. For another thing, Russia was back in the game, as it were, under a new president, President Vladimir Putin, and uh, Russo-Chinese relations had been re-established. Uh, a, 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 a balance of sorts had emerged in the world while the United States was still the most powerful country. Uh, it was not uh, possible for the United States to do everything alone. And uh, China was also uh, being considered a, a diplomatic pole and in some parts of the world, even a military pole. Uh, and finally, the gap between India and China uh, widened rapidly between 2000 and 2010 economically, diplomatically, and militarily. And therefore, I surmise that by 2006 or seven, and certainly by 2010, uh, the Chinese had concluded that uh, this gap would continue to widen and that they were not really, um, uh, it was not really necessary to show any sort of a concession or an accommodation to India uh, because uh, uh, they were in a much better position than we were. Uh, perhaps they also felt there would be no backlash uh, because of the gap the, 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 in, in comprehensive power. Uh, and therefore, you saw a visible uh, change in the India-China relationship, uh, which has continued under the current president. Now, uh, it is a moot point as to whether the presumptions they made were correct or not. But this, at least, I feel is one of the interpretations one can put on, the, on why China sort of appeared to change, change tack and move away from the uh, modus vivendi that uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and Deng Xiaoping had evolved in 1989, in 1988. Uh, 
to, to the audience, uh, if there are any questions, please uh, post them on Facebook or Zoom, wherever, where, wherever you are. Uh, I have a follow-up question to the, uh, on the, on the India-China relationship chapter. You know, what did, in your mind, because you observe it very closely, what did India do right during the period? And what it did not do so right during that period in its assessment and dealing with China? Uh, I'm talking about the 30 year period, 30 year period covered in your, in your book. And what are the big lessons it holds for us today as we deal with the situation with China, what, what, what it is? Well, I just want to make two points here, Sushantji. One is that uh, we cannot fault the Indian side for taking initiatives uh, in this period. Uh, as I uh, uh, say in my book, uh, almost any initiative on the boundary issue, for instance, and even on other subjects such as trade or uh, uh, trans-border rivers, essentially came from our side. Uh, we wanted to make progress and we suggested a number of mechanisms uh, on trying to do so. And I think therefore, uh, to some degree, uh, it is the Chinese who uh, uh, were either unresponsive or simply went through the, the, the motions uh, of the process. Uh, the second point I think which is equally important here is that um, uh, it, during this period, our effort was to build a strong bilateral relationship with China. By that, I don't mean friendship. I mean uh, 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 a relationship that uh, was stable, uh, which was predictable, and which uh, was of advantage to both sides. Uh, uh, as we now know, the Chinese perhaps may not have seen it that way. Uh, they may have seen it as an opportunity to buy time, uh, but they never really took us as uh, 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 as a serious power. Uh, they continued to look at us through the prism of great power relations. Uh, and therefore, there was a certain mismatch in our approach. Uh, I think we have understood that. And, uh, and I think that, you know, uh, certainly going forward, Indian policy uh, is much more, uh, is much clearer in, in that understanding that uh, perhaps China does not look at us the same way as we look at China and we need to recalibrate our view. Uh, now, uh, you know, there are a number of instances where uh, we, have, we did have uh, success during this period. I think diplomacy during the nuclear tests was very adroitly handled by us. Uh, considering that here was a permanent member of the Security Council hell-bent on ensuring that a nuclear apartheid system or regime continued. Uh, I also think the long uh, game that we played, which finally led them to recognize Sikkim as a part of India, was also a success. And the, nucleus, uh, the, the waiver that we got from the NSG was a success as well. So in a number of areas, we did have successes. I think where we perhaps might uh, have done better was utilizing the 20 years of peace uh, along the line of actual control to uh, build up capacities. Uh, I think China uh, built up capacities uh, much better than ours. Now we have to, uh, uh, of course, accept that China considered itself a global power. And therefore it was building up capacities vis-a-vis what it considers as its peer competitors, the United States, to some degree, the Russian Federation, even Japan. But, you know, capacities can be moved from one theater of conflict to another. And therefore, uh, there is no gainsaying that they outstripped us in military capacities during those years. Uh, and I think that too is now being rectified uh, through various policy measures and through uh, recent announcements of a number of uh, joint ventures that we have uh, uh, you know, announced whether it is that uh, transport aircraft with Airbus or uh, the recent news I saw yesterday in the media about Bharat Forge selling uh, sophisticated uh, guns, which is a JV venture to some third party. Uh, so I think I think we are we we have learned from what happened in those twenty years, but uh, uh, it will take a while to catch up, of course. Uh, would it be fair to say, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gokhale, that the way the Chinese were able to bite their intentions and pose themselves as a benign power vis-a-vis -vis the West, they were also able to do that to a certain extent vis-a-vis uh, -vis India as well? The Indians also saw them as something uh, a more benign power than what they really were? Uh, maybe for some part of the time, but I certainly believe from 2006, 5, 6 onwards, 
uh, I don't think that was the perception. The problem was that the rest of the world was still invested there. Uh, we now forget that the United States needed China because of Iran and Afghanistan. Uh, uh, Russia also needed China because, you know, it, Putin, Putin was just making his way back into international affairs. Uh, countries like uh, Europe and, I mean, uh, regions like Europe and countries like Japan and Australia were hugely invested economically in China. And therefore, I think that there would have been relatively less takers if uh, we were to say that China posed something of a strategic challenge to many countries than there is today. Today, that gets much more resonance because a lot of other uh, uh, former partners of China have realized what we have been saying for some time. And here I certainly will put forward uh, uh, one example of how we have, in a sense, judged China uh, or sized them up much earlier than others. Look at our position on the Belt and Road Initiative. In May 2017, we are the only country which does not send a representative to Beijing. Even the Americans sent a representative from the Department of Commerce the Japanese sent the secretary general of their ruling party. Uh, of course, they claimed these were not official, but of course they are. Uh, and it is only now, much later, that they are singing the same tune as we are. So in a sense, some, I think by and large, our assessments have been okay. Uh, but uh, given our relative weight in the international system, uh, perhaps it has been difficult to convince others. Uh, and only over time, as the Chinese behavior has changed, have they come around to our thinking. Uh, we have a couple of audience questions. Uh, Jayesh Mathur wants to know that one of the most common utterances uh, in communication by the Chinese foreign ministry in the recent past has been uh, managing differences, particularly in the context of territorial and maritime disputes. This term has been used extensively in the post-Galwan post era. Is it indicative of a pattern to dictate the terms of engagement after establishing dominance, he wants to know? I wouldn't put it that way, but what they mean by managing differences is rather different from what we understand as managing differences. Uh, for them, managing differences means addressing their concerns, but uh, not agitating our concerns. Uh, and uh, restricting our concerns, if at all they are to be raised or agitated, to a functional level and not to the higher political level. From our perspective, managing differences means managing uh, issues that both sides are concerned with. And this has always been, and I think I mentioned this in the chapter on India-China relations too, a problem in the relationship. Uh, China has rarely uh, felt it necessary to deal with India's concerns in a manner which are satisfactory to us, but always expect us to deal even with their relatively uh, peripheral concerns with a great degree of seriousness. Um, I think um, uh, this was realized fairly early on and on a number of issues such as on the Taiwan issue, for instance, we have stopped mentioning Taiwan in all our joint statements and rightly so. Uh, a country which in the, from the very outset recognized the People's Republic of China as the only legitimate government of China should not be asked to repeatedly reiterate a position which the Chinese love to describe as principle, because you can't have a better principle than this. Uh, and similarly on other issues now, we have begun to demonstrate that sensitivity has to be reciprocal. So I don't think that uh, we, this is uh, 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 a sort of a domination kind of uh, induced uh, uh, formula, but it certainly is one which is unilateral or unidirectional, I would say. Uh, the, another question is from Leela Sai Anil Kumar. Uh, he wants to know what's the probability of big MNCs uh, shifting their production units from China to India? Is it a concern for the big MNCs as they because they may put at risk uh, the big middle class market that the China that the, that the China provides to them. Yeah, that's an excellent question, and this is exactly where we need an Indian perspective and deep Indian research, because the popular narrative is that uh, companies are fleeing China yeah. and looking and hunting for uh, alternative sites. Uh, if you were to read the report of the European Chamber of Commerce or a, or the American Chamber of Commerce or other such reports. Uh, it is very clear that what they are concerned about 
is the over leveraged positions they have in china because their manufacturing is almost entirely concentrated there and therefore the need to diversify in a china plus 1 or china plus 2 option so that the supply chains do not get completely blocked if there is a black swan event as happened in covid uh, there is no uh, 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 there is no movement by any western company to leave china lock stock and barrel in fact many china uh, many uh, uh, european and american companies have said that whatever investments have been made in china have been profitable and will continue to remain there to serve the chinese market because a lot of the larger corporations make massive profits from china even now uh, and uh, if you see the recent uh, uh, german companies which went with the chancellor almost all of those companies which went and these are the blue chip uh, companies of china, of germany have announced fresh investments or fresh initiatives uh so what we should be looking to attract is that additional investment that the west is intending to make outside china to ensure that the supply chains are not completely blocked if there is a problem with china now in that regard uh, i think we are not the only investment destination uh to my mind there are at least two other countries which have been three other countries which have attracted uh uh the attention of the west one is vietnam uh the other is malaysia and the third of course much closer to home is bangladesh uh because what the investor is looking for is ease of doing business in a broad sense and by ease of doing business i don't just mean policy i mean labor laws i mean repatriation of profits i mean intellectual property protection uh all those issues which the west keeps talking about so i think that we have a fair degree of competition to beat in this process uh, now there are some obvious reasons why the countries uh, the these companies should invest with us uh, uh, the size of the market the talent pool the the the, the relatively young age of the working population and so on and so forth uh, but ultimately the the investments will go to the country which presents the best ecosystem uh and so we shall see uh, how successful we are and how successful others might be in attracting it but we should be clear about one thing foreign uh, uh, companies are not going to leave china for a very long time and nor are they going to dilute their current holdings there uh, and therefore we should uh, understand that that will continue to power the chinese economy uh, we have another question from uh, from angshuman what is the significance of uh, xi jinping breaking the norms to the communist party whether it is the third term for the party general secretary or people in the uh, politburo or the politburo standing standing committee and how will it affect its policy towards india and other countries globally i don't think it will have any great effect on uh, on foreign policy uh and uh, domestically uh, of course it merely reinforces his position and his power which were already evident in the five years preceding this congress i think the real impact will come uh when uh, for whatever reason he has to step down or he has to go because uh, when you have an authoritarian system that is dominant for a long period uh then the risk during a succession is much greater it causes a succession crisis now in democracies there are mechanisms to handle that succession crisis and it is called an election but in the case of china the few norms that were in place to handle the succession which is deng xiaoping's uh, uh, term limit that the president shall serve and serve only two terms and that by implication the general secretary will also only serve two terms and the age limit that if you are 68 and above you leave because these have been removed by president xi jinping uh, the likelihood of a succession crisis increases because you have removed some of the few markers that existed which would moderate that so what we really need to study is uh, what will happen uh, further down the line 2027 2032 when uh, the president gets older when ultimately fatigue and health set in uh when, who will how will that succession look like because it will clearly have to be subterranean 
And as we know, subterranean crises are subject to violent eruptions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, uh, and that is effectively what happened. The Tiananmen incident was also in one sense, a political battle within the party. So uh, uh, we, uh, uh, I think uh, the question uh, should also be what the implications of that succession crisis will be. Because we very conveniently uh, ignore the fact that we are a politically stable entity. We have had 14 general elections with a peaceful transfer of power. In the case of China, in its 70 years, the only two peaceful transfers of power have been 2002 and 2012. And both are based on the norms that Deng Xiaoping set and which Xi Jinping has knocked out. Uh, aside from these two, power has been transferred with a certain degree of violence or force in, on, on every other occasion. When Mao died uh, during the Tiananmen crisis uh, and, and, and presumably uh, going ahead too. So we need to be really focused on it. We need to do a lot of work on China's internal uh, developments from an Indian perspective. There's a question from uh, Rajesh VP. Would US and China go to war over Taiwan and would it draw India in? Oh, that's an impossibly hypothetical question to answer. Uh, I think we, uh, my own sense is, uh, uh, again, uh, I think that there may be a certain degree of misperception on both sides where Taiwan is concerned. Uh, the West assumes that Taiwan looks at Taiwan and says, logically, the Chinese would not really want to take it over uh, if they lose uh, the economic advantage there. But they don't understand that Taiwan is an emotive issue for the people. We as Indians understand uh, emotion attached to sovereignty and territorial integrity because we too face a challenge. The West doesn't face that. Of course, now Ukraine is facing that and they're beginning to understand it. So I think to a certain degree, there's, there might be a misjudgment on the part of the US. Uh, China too might misjudge the situation because while I think today it has the capability to breach the first island chain and arguably a naval blockade of Taiwan might even succeed in, uh, in, 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 in succeeding. Uh, the problem is in holding that uh, place. Uh, can you hold Taiwan intact? Because it involves boots on the ground. And as we have seen in the Ukraine, a, a, a technologically and bigger military force uh, might put boots on the ground, but it is increasingly difficult to hold that territory with substantial loss and to take the loss. So I think in both sides, there may be some misperception. Uh, that having been said, I really am in no position to suggest or predict what might happen in the next few years. Uh, whether India gets drawn in or not depends on what the scale of that uh, uh, conflict might be and what the nature of that conflict might be. Uh, but of course, in principle, we have uh, accepted that there is only one China. Uh, our position is that obviously it all has to be through peaceful negotiation, as is also the case with us where territory is involved. Uh, that's a vital principle for us. But how the leadership will react in this hypothetical situation is something that is difficult to speak to. Uh, BP Singh want, uh, wants to know how deep is China's relationship with Pakistan, especially in the current environment where Pakistan is going through a very uncertain scenario and the, and the challenges Chinese companies uh, are facing with the CPEC project there. I have always felt, Sushanji, that there is no empathy in the relationship with Pakistan. It is all strategy uh, and a, a relatively cost effective uh, way of keeping uh, China's major competitor in the 21st century, which is the Republic of India, tied down uh, uh, and, and allow China freedom to deal with uh, bigger challenges that it has, the United States and potentially down the road, possibly even Russia. Uh, or, 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 or an Eastern NATO, uh, um, uh, although I don't believe there's anything such thing as an Eastern NATO. So I think that uh, uh, th that is the reason why they are there. Uh, I, I think they are confident enough that they have enough leverage with all the elites, that is the political leadership, the military leadership and the business leadership, and that those elites can keep the population under control. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, matter of fact, a mundane strategic relationship. 
Uh, but beyond that, uh, it is not like the Anglo-American alliance. There is no empathy between the two powers. There is no social economic convergence. There is no cultural connect. Uh, in fact, I mean, uh, uh, I could arguably say that there is a greater cultural connect with India uh, uh, in the in the minds of the Chinese population than with Pakistan. My colleague Mimi Korean wants to know, when one looks at the lingering shadows Tiananmen has cast on Chinese politics, and in particular on the CCP, uh, is Xi Jinping now the beneficiary of the U-turn that the party makes uh, following uh, the 1989 crisis to institutionalize a return to centralization of power, then being its primary mover, as many, as many portray it to be? But, you know, the, the initial outcome of the Tiananmen incident was that the leadership felt there should be decentralization of decision making and competition between the provinces and between the counties and the districts. And therefore, even within the party, between the party secretary of one province and the party secretary of another or the governors of provinces, uh, to a certain extent that centralization has occurred after President Xi Jinping has, has taken power. Uh, and it has occurred for two reasons. One, of course, is because uh, he perhaps had reason to believe that decentralization had led to a certain amount of political confusion within the party and weakened it. Uh, but also, I think there are personal reasons. Uh, the reason for consolidating his personal power has also led to a certain recentralization of authority. So it's a very uh, 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 sort of it's a combination of the two, uh, concern for the party and concern for his own position, which has led to this decentralization. I don't think this is a direct outcome of the Tiananmen crisis, but I think the larger concern that the party might be losing traction, uh, which has always been a concern of the Chinese leadership, might uh, Tiananmen plays into that. So to that in a sort of indirect way, yes, perhaps. Uh, a couple of questions, and I'll just uh, put them together about the uh, the the Sino Sino Russian relationship and what effect it will have on have on India, especially the increasing Russian dependence on China for various uh, on various aspects. Uh, Sushanti, my view has always been that we must again look at the Sino Russian relationship from an Indian perspective. Uh, there are various kinds of alliances. Uh, there are alliances like the Anglo-American Anglo alliance where there is a connect between these two countries in every aspect. Uh, we need to ask ourselves whether there is such a connect between Russia and China. Uh, ideologically, there is very little connect. Uh, culturally, too, Russia is increasingly a, a, a Russian Orthodox-led uh, 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 state. Uh, China uh, is irreligious in that sense. Uh, Russia looks and considers itself ultimately European. It's another matter that the Europeans don't wish to think so at the moment. Uh, China is very Asian, but Russia does not think itself as Asian. Its identity is basically European. So to my mind, uh, I would characterize the relationship this way. They are not standing face to face looking into each other's eyes. They are standing back to back, holding spears. The Russians holding a spear westward against the United States, the Chinese holding a spear east, easterly facing against the United States. They are both minding each other's backs against the United States. We also need to see whether there are any fault lines. And I believe there are. Uh, of course, the fault lines are not just uh, economic. There is a growing dependency that Russia has. The Russians probably rightly feel they are being squeezed by the Chinese, being taken advantage of. But there is also the territorial question. Uh, even though the Chinese government has said that the boundary is final, uh, we have seen that when it suits China, they, treat, they, they, they tear up treaties. The 1950 treaty with the Soviet Union was supposed to be indestructible and eternal, but it collapsed in 10 years. And the Chinese public have from time to time talked about their claims in the Far East. You also have the emerging problem of the Arctic, you have an, a, a, a sort of a, a concern in Russia that the influence in Central Asia is, is waning because of growing Chinese influence. So there are a whole host of fault lines. I'm not saying that these fault lines uh, might immediately be, become active. But what I'm saying is as Indians, we need to uh, research them, see whether these actually balance out that so-called tight alliance, no limits partnership that exists, 
and then ask ourselves whether from the Indian perspective this will impact in India-Russia relations in a positive or a negative light. Now, I am not enough of a, a, a sort of, I have not studied Russia enough to make that judgment. I, there are many competent people in India who have done a lot of work on Russia. I'm only pleading for the fact that we need not look at uh, Russo-Chinese relations from a Western perspective. This is one area where we desperately need an Indian perspective. And I hope that, you know, scholars in CPR, and I, I want to say hello to Nini, I know her well, uh, you know, people like her or others uh, actually take up this issue. Uh, before we end, I have one question. Why are Chinese leaders so enamored of similes, metaphors, and these catchphrases, catch statements, which we always seem coming from them, whether it is causing yeah. them by feeling these stones or killing the chicken to scare the tiger or pointing the finger at the moon. You know, why, why, why this great fascination for these, for these one-liners? That's a lovely question, Suchanji, and I have my own explanation, but you know, this is just one interpretation. Uh, my view is that, you know, we, we forget in a democracy where our leaders talk to the people every day on television, on radio, in public rallies, in election uh, campaigns, and so on. They talk every day about their plans and therefore communication between the leaders and their people are very smooth in a democracy. We forget that in an authoritarian state like China, none of these channels work. Chiang Zemin does not uh, uh, have to uh, address election rallies or public rallies or, or uh, uh, give interviews on the radio or television or do something like a monkey bath. Uh, and therefore the only means of communication is in a written form through the public media, which is again state controlled, People's Daily or the state controlled social media. Therefore, my own view is that such similes and metaphors are used by them to message their own people on issues which are of vital importance. And it is not so much to message the outside world as to message their own people. Their own people understand metaphors the way that we understand metaphors in Hindi or other languages which become ridiculous when they are translated into English. Uh, and therefore, I point out in my, my long game that we need to listen very carefully to these metaphors because when they change the metaphor, their real intention is not to signal you, it is to signal their own establishment and their public opinion that they are changing position. Uh, we very often don't understand how important this aspect is in China. We tend to disregard what earlier used to be a very vital part of China watching, which is you parse each word and phrase for meaning. Uh, we tend to now think China is a normal state, but it isn't. And therefore, my interpretation is that these are signals which the leadership gives to its people on how and what public position to take on issues of critical national security or economic importance. That's my interpretation, but it's not... Uh, anything definitive. Uh, I, before uh, before I end, I can only think of one metaphor. The wise man points to the moon. The fool uh, the uh, the fool looks at the finger and not at the moon or something something to that effect. You are <laughs> the wise man here, Mr. Gokhale. You have written the book and told us. All. <laughs> we hope we have not been the fools by looking at the finger and not at the moon that you are pointing to, that you are pointing to. Uh, thank you so much for taking out the time for this book discussion and for also for writing this wonderful book. Uh, we look forward to your to your next book. It was really educational uh, to listen to you and discuss and discuss this with, this with you. Uh, on behalf of Center for Policy Research and Yamini Ayer, I wish to thank you again, and we look forward to hosting you sometime in person as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Yamini ji. Thank you, Suchanji. It's a great pleasure. I look forward to it also. Thank you so much. Thank you.